Hello fellow truth seekers, this is Barbara Jean. I want to talk about condemnation today. Um, uh, I had, first of all, I had a great day yesterday. Yesterday was August 1st. What a lovely day we had. We had some uh, family over and uh, we had a, a pancake lunch. <laughs> it was supposed to be pancake, pancake brunch, but it ended up being a pancake lunch. And, uh, but anyway, it was lovely. We had, oh, we laughed so much, laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. We ended up, uh, one of my sisters said that she laughed so hard. She was gives, giving her a headache. Oh, we laughed hysterically, but, uh, oh, it was such a good time. And so today I'm in such a good mood. I want to talk about condemnation. <laughs> oh, it's too much. Um, I wanted to talk about how, um, you know, the more my eyes are being opened and the Lord is setting me free and the church is being set free from the spirit of religion, the more I'm seeing it. I mean, I always, I could see it before. And in fact, I was even involved in religion. I grew up in a church that said that you're heathens if you have musical instruments in your church. We grew up a cappella in the church we were in. And if you had a, a, an instrument in your church, my goodness, it's, you're a heathen. <laughs> Thinking about it now, how silly it is, but that's the way we thought because of that one verse in the Bible, it says, and they sang and made, made melody in their hearts. And it says nothing about any musical instrument. Of course, they ignore the fact that David wrote uh, Psalms and hymns to the Lord on his harp. Well, maybe we could have a heart, but we didn't have a heart because it was religious. The religious ways of man saying you can't have a, you can't have a musical instrument because it makes you a heathen, and uh, that's how religious. I mean, I grew up religious people. I mean, you know, nobody you couldn't drink wine, you couldn't anybody smoke a cigarette. Oh my goodness! And that's what actually led to uh, the church falling apart eventually. This religious spirit became. Um, we've lost our freedom in Christ where people were telling people how to be how to be more Christian. I don't see how you can be more Christian than getting into Christ Jesus through the waters of baptism and putting them on putting them on as your identity. And there's the Holy Spirit. I had I knew a woman who was very, very wise, and this was years later when I was really starting to come out of that religious mindset. And I met her, I think I met her trying to remember if I was in my 20s or my 30s. Mm, I have a feeling I met her in my early 30s. I met this woman, an older lady, um, quite elderly. I think I, when I met her, she was at least in her 70s. And uh, one day, I, she had invited me over for a cup of tea and a little conversation at her, her apartment. And I went over and we had this really nice talk. And she told me something that I thought was rather interesting. She said um, years ago when she was a young girl, um, the Lord told her specifically not to wear earrings. No, it said nothing about necklaces, but the Lord spoke to her on her to, she's to not wear earrings. Now the Lord sometimes tells us to do and to not do things for our, for whatever reason, whether it's a matter of obedience or it's a calling just like, for instance, Samson, Samson was told not to drink wine. He was not to cut his hair, blah, 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 all the things he did. And then he ended up doing it anyway. But he was in order to sanctify him or set him apart. He was told not to do certain things. And his mother was also told not to do certain things in order to bring this prophet into the world. Now, God didn't say now that the Samson guy has come in and he doesn't cut his hair. Nobody's allowed to cut their hair from now on. See, that, was, that would be what a religious person would do. They would say, God called me not to, to go dancing or God, Lord God told me that I wasn't to um, dye my hair or I wasn't to wear black or not to wear white. Or, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes we feel that the Lord, I'm not saying that they, the God is or not saying because obviously God sometimes tells people to not do certain things or to do certain things. For instance, Jeremiah, lay on your side. <laughs> Jeremiah do this, Isaiah do that, Hosea do, do this, you're supposed to marry a prostitute, blah, 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 all these different things. Are we, is everyone supposed to marry a prostitute? No. <laughs> but you see, the religious mind says if someone's done it and it had good results, 
or had this particular results, then everyone's supposed to do it. Okay. So um, anyway, this, this wise woman told me about what the Lord told me that the Lord told her that she was not supposed to wear earrings. But she was very wise because she, she made it very clear. God called her not to wear earrings for whatever reasons, that it was something in her soul that needed to follow in obedience to the Lord. And she was very wise because she never ever made said to anybody else, because I can't wear earrings, you can't wear earrings either. Okay, just saying. But there's a lot of people who, for instance, may have a problem with alcohol, who may have problems with drugs, or may have, I'm not saying go and have drugs, please, please, no, absolutely not. Don't go and you have marijuana. There are some things that just open the doors to demons. That's all there is to it. But there's other things such as, you know, enjoying um, conversation or having a glass of wine or, um, you know, <laughs> going to the beach. You know, these, these are things that I remember growing up. I loved going to the beach. I loved sticking my feet in the, in the cold water. You know, there's modest apparel on the beach. This is like there's in in modest apparel. Now, if it's a problem for you to go to the beach and if people all around you are dressed in modestly and your mind goes places that it shouldn't go, then I would recommend you don't go there. But you are not everybody else. Not everybody has a problem with people going, you know, going to the beach. They can keep their minds clean. Now, it is a little difficult when most today's apparel, beach apparel, has gotten skimpier and skimpier till it's practically nothing. And it is practically nothing. It is very difficult to get to the beach. Now, I'll have to admit that. But, you know, you, the Holy Spirit's going to let you know if you're led by the Spirit, don't go to the beach. It's just not a place you want to hang out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> But it's, it's this religious spirit that says, because I can't do something, you can't do it either. You know what I'm saying? This is what I'm saying. Um, Peter, they made it very clear when they, when they had this council in Jerusalem with Paul, and they were trying to figure out what they should tell the Gentiles to, uh, what, what laws are we going to tell the Jews, or to the non-Jews to follow? Circumcision? No. That's not going to be one of them. Uh, uh, sacrifice here or go there and on this day, blah, 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 blah. No. You see, the only thing they, they, they told the Gentiles to do was abstain from blood, abstain from things sacrificed to idols, keep yourself pure from immorality in the world, basically from fornication. Um, that would be pornography. Yeah, that would be included in there. Um, um and if you, like I said, if you're going to the beach and if it's having, you're having your, your mind's going places it shouldn't go, don't go to the beach. You know what I'm saying? So, but there, there are other things that are like, for instance, for instance, you go out for dinner with, with an, a group of people and, and they're all having a glass of wine, but inside you're going, now if God told you not to have a glass of wine, that's one thing. But because someone else is having a glass of wine and they're Christian and saying, oh, they're not Christian because they're drinking wine. <gasps> That's religious. Just saying. And I can prove it. That's religious. Yes, there's a lot of verses in the Bible that talks about drinking spirits and wine. Yes, there is. That are not good. But there's also other verses in the Bible that says it is. For instance, just a for instance, do this in remembrance of me. They weren't drinking water, people. They weren't drinking milk. They were drinking wine. Okay? They were drinking wine. And he says, when you get together and you you break the bread and you drink the cup, remember my body. Do this in remembrance of me. So how are you supposed to do this in remembrance of him? Drinking wine, whether it's fermented or unfermented, how are you to not drink wine if he told you to drink it? Just saying. I heard to someone recently, I mean, <laughs> and I, I listen to this guy sparingly. I just, I, you know, Sometimes he has interesting things to say, but mostly he's quite, he's very, very religious, very religious. And so I listened to him quite sparingly, but anyway, he was talking about how, because there's so many bad verses about drinking wine in the Bible, he's never, he's never touching another thing that has to do with grapes. He's not even going to eat raisins. What? <laughs> he was trying to tell everybody, he was trying to get everybody to stop eating grapes and raisins. 
That's religious. You see, I hope you see what I'm saying. That's religious. Because if that's the case, then you can't take the Lord's Supper. And Jesus commanded you to take the Lord's Supper. <laughs> that's a reptile religious spirit. I'm telling you. I, and I, I, <laughs> anyway, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It also reminds me here of what Jesus talks about in Luke. Luke, um, Luke, in five, he says, "Putting old wines in new skins." Why would Jesus talk about wine if it was such a bad thing? Uh, Luke five thirty three, and he said to him, "Why do the the disciples of John fast often, and make prayers? And likewise, the disciples of the Pharisees they eat and but thine eat, eat and drink." So he, they, here is somebody. Um, who is it now? I was talking to him about this. Um, I know the the Pharisees and the Levites were, pers were were pursuing Jesus with what kinds of... The Pharisees were here murmuring, Luke 5.30, but the scribes and the Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? What? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Are we blind or are we blind? I was listening to this guy who I, this other guy who I really, really, really enjoy. I just discovered him. And anyway, he's uh, kind of a, in a, he's not an evangelist. He's more of an, a motivational, spiritual speaker. And, uh, and he was, he was, oh, I was really enjoying his sermon. And all of a sudden in the middle of his, whatever it was, you know, this, talk he was giving, he suddenly said, I was asked out to dinner uh to to drink wine with the guys and i didn't do it because i'm a christian and i thought to myself he just he just what he, he had to throw this religious thing in there he had to throw religion in uh, he, oh he had this really really good thing going and all of a sudden boom there goes the religion religion had to be thrown in and he missed the whole point be now that because i'm a christian we don't drink wine and I, oh he just ruined it. It ruined it for me, at least. It, I, it, everything else went out the out the out the door, and <laughs> all the good things he was spouting. And then all of a sudden, and because we're Christian, we don't drink wine. I was like, whoa, hold on, just a second. But the scribes and the Pharisees murmured against his his, his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous. But the sinners to repentance. Oh, and guess what? That would be all of them, even the scribes and the Pharisees. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink? What? They go out to dinner? They drink wine? What? And he said unto them, Can, the, can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and they shall fast in those days. Um, but no, and he spake this parable unto them: No man putteth a new garment, piece of new garment, upon an old. If otherwise, both the new uh, maketh the rent, and the piece that is taken out of it, the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man puts new wine in old bottles, as the or else the new wine will burst the bo the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. He's just, he's he's. He's comparing us to wine? <laughs> I guess he is. New wine must be put into new bottles. Both are preserved. No man also have drunk old wine straightway desireth new. For he saith the old is better. Okay, now let's just keep going. There is, uh, so he goes on and he talks about the Sabbath and how he's the Lord of the Sabbath. So all these religious people were trying to tell him, you can't do this on on the Sabbath. You can't do that. You can't do this. You can't go here. You can't eat that. Blah 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 blah. With all these religious ideologies, man's religion, and he burst their bubbles again and said, uh, "I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. <laughs> if I want to heal somebody on a Sabbath, I'll do it. If I want to pluck an ear of grain on that day, I'll do it. Don't tell me what I can and can't do on a Sabbath. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I created it." <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, that's religion. <laughs> he 
So here it is. Um, he talks about how David went into the, the, the house of the Lord and ate the, the showbread. What? He did what was unlawful. And God let him. <laughs> and then, so here he goes on and he talks about, um, calls us 12. Then he gives the Beatitudes. And he pronounces his woes on the Pharisees, those, those religious spirits. Um, and how they love to be... They love to judge other people. They love to tell, condemn people for what they're doing, what they're eating, what they're saying, where they're going. They, they have a whole lot of attitudes about everybody else and how they live. And yet they themselves are blind guides and they have no idea. They are full of hypocrisies. And uh, then he goes and builds, he says, build your house on the rock. And then <laughs> chapter seven, he says to them, um, about John the Baptist. Here's John the Baptist, and he talk, brings up baptism again. John 7, 18. Let's just go there, I think. And the disciples of John shewed him all these things. And John calling unto him, two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or we look uh, for another? So John is really doubting now. He's wondering what's going on, because maybe he heard about how Jesus was going around and mingling with the sinners and drinking wine when John himself was wearing animal skins and you know abstaining and uh, he was he was he had the baptism of repentance and change he was a very very religious man very 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 religious and he was calling people to repentance but he was not calling people into the kingdom of Christ because he was not yet himself in it he wasn't in it he wasn't called for that that's why the least in the kingdom will be greater than John what? Yes. As great as John was, and Jesus said there was no man, a woman that was born that was greater than John at that moment. Of course, Jesus excels them, and so is everybody who's in Christ. The least in the kingdom will be greater than John. Okay, just saying. John was wearing these animal skins, <laughs> and here he was, and John's starting to go, what? I'm hearing these rumors about you? <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, yeah, he's healing the sick, but he's drinking wine. What? Drinking wine? You see Messiah? Uh, have I made a mistake? <laughs> oh, dear. And when the men came, when the men were unto him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come? Or are we looking for another? <laughs> They didn't understand because that religious mind doesn't get it. And uh, <laughs> and in that same hour, he, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and and of evil spirits. And many uh, unto many that were blind, he gave sight. So obviously his drinking wine and hanging out with the sinners didn't stop Jesus. He's was, he was in the world, but he was not of the world. And because he wasn't a sinner, even though he's hanging out with the sinners and drinking wine... <laughs> He was able to do what no other man could do. Okay? He was setting the people free from the religious spirit that had been controlling the world. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard. And how they how that the blind see, the lame walk, the leopards are cleansed, the deaf, are, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he who whosoever shall not be offended in me. You see, the religious spirit is offended. You see, the religious spirit is offended by the freedom of Christ. They're offended by the children of God because we are children of the free woman. We are set free from that religious minded spirit of the reptile brain of that creature brain we're set free and it it's offensive to them it's offensive to have freedom which is in Christ Jesus and in Christ alone when you're set free from the spirit of of condemnation and spirit of sin when you have been set free you're no longer under under the condemnation of man you're not and that drives them crazy because they can't control you and when the messengers of John were, were departed, he began to speak unto the people, saying concerning, What went he out into the, the, the wilderness to see a reed shaken in the wind? But what, sh but what went he out for to see a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that are gorgeously apparelled and live del delic delicately are in king's courts. 
And this is what I was saying before. John was wearing an animal skin, which represents the old covenant. You think about in the garden, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they ate, they were beautifully garment. They were wearing the white raiment of purity that, that wouldn't allow anybody to see that they were naked. What they saw was light and truth and this white garment that they were wearing. That's what others saw. No one was permitted to view their nudity. Not even God was interested in viewing their, in, their nudity, even though he created them naked. Okay? But when they ate that fruit that changed their DNA, removed their, got destroyed their immortality, and gave them this beast seed, the seed of this, the beast of, of creation, and not just any beast, the serpent seed, that reptile seed, and they took it into their bodies and it, 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 it took rain in their stomach because it was a fruit. They had to eat it, hit in their stomach, and that's where it took root. It goes back to my little chart. The seed of Satan is in the stomach. That in the last couple of videos. So once they did that, they lost their God likeness. Okay? They lost their God likeness. And as a result of losing their God likeness, they are no more, they had beasts in them. They were no longer completely like God. Not saying that they are God because there is only one God. But when God created us in his image, male and female, he created us, created us in his likeness. In their likeness, we were created to be like God. And when we ate that fruit in the garden, we lost that likeness. Didn't mean that we lost our form, but it, we lost the light. <laughs> we lost, we became shameful, we became religious, we became all those things that the beast is, that reptile brain, which I gave you the long list of reptile reptile characteristics. It was there, and we, their proof of it was Adam and Eve were instantly ashamed. Adam and Eve ran, they felt condemned. They wouldn't try to hide their hide their sin rather than confess it did all the things that a reptile would do. Rep they became reptilian. Even in the smallest degree, they became reptilian. And that little tiny degree was enough. And it only continued to grow. And that's what I'm telling you. Satan is after your brain. He's after the way you think. He's after the way you act. He's trying to control you. He's after your brain. Now that he's got, he's got a, a, a throne in your, his throne established in your stomach. Now he's going after your brain. Okay, he's going after the brain and look at Cain. It didn't take long. He killed his brother. That was a reptilian thing to do. But what's interesting, like I said, in the garden, God didn't couldn't clothe them in King King's garment, which is right here. But hold they that are gorgeously appelled and appareled and live delicately are in the in King's court. When we come to Christ and we put on Christ, we are going to be delicately and beautifully clothed in our godlike garments in the king's court. But John was still wearing animal skins. He was he died, he was decapitated before he could be baptized into Jesus Christ. It was not his calling, but he was the greatest of the old covenant. He was the greatest of the old covenant. But the least in the kingdom is going to be greater than John. Because John didn't have the opportunity to be born again. And he was a representation of the old covenant. The best of the old covenant. The best of the old covenant per period. I mean, he, John, Jesus didn't even compare him to Moses. He said he was the greatest. If he said he was the greatest, then he means he was the greatest of the old covenant. Think about that, people. That's huge. And that's why when we when they clothed, he clothed them in animal skin in the garden. He was saying, you're putting on animal skin. And after year after year after year after year after year, and animal after the sacrifice, the, the bloody sacrifice, just try and stay, just try to keep from becoming more and more animalistic. And look what happened to, uh, to pre-flood, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, um, Babylon, the more you, if you, you fall, once there's a fall, it only has to go down if without a sacrifice. You're going to keep going down. It's going to, your, your humanity is going to continue to grade as you become more and more animalistic. Just saying, it's the truth. 
when if you if there's no sacrifice and they were forced to sacrifice millions and millions and millions of animals in order to maintain their humanity but it couldn't take away their sin and so they were always stuck in this continual ritual this religious act of constantly sacrificing because they it, they couldn't go above what they had fallen into at their at, at the in the smallest degree of sin one little spot or wrinkle made them less than god not like again i'm not saying that you're god please don't go there but we were created to be like god and that little spot as tiny as that little sin seemed to be just taking a little bite of that fruit was enough to throw them out of the garden, lose their mortality, immortality, do all kinds of awful things, get them all kinds of crazy ideas, get Satan involved in their lives, and they lost their godlikeness. That little act. And as a result, it just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. Until you're completely a beast. And we know that for a fact that there are some people in this world who are really, really, really beastly. In fact, they practice most a lot of these people we can see with our own eyes are less not even hardly human. They're hardly human in the things that they've done and the way they've treated humanity. They've lost their humanity and become pure beasts. Okay? Pure beasts. Just saying. So as a result of, of that, and I'm getting back to what I was trying to talk about here was religion and this religious spirit. Um, that this beast, like I said, John, he wore, he wore this garment. And then when Christ came, he became man sinless but he still had that little seed of satan in him in his stomach and that 40 days of fasting brought it to the surface and he was sanctified after his baptism baptized in the water sinless man came up now he had to go through the process of sanctification of his flesh of his spirit he had to get that seed out not because he was a sinner but because he was born in sin because he was a human being and that seed of adam was in him and the only way for it to come out was for him to fast 40 days and be weakened enough for it to come to the surface. And when he rejected it, it was like taking that, that fruit that, that Adam and Eve ate. <clears throat> That's what he was doing. He was spitting it out, people. Um, and that during that 40-day fast, he was spitting out the seed. And he was now no longer tainted with that sin of Adam. He became a spotless man. Spotless. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. <laughs> but as a result, he became, not only was he, he became human, which it talks about in Romans. Romans 8, it talks about how Romans 8, he was, um, there is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Jesus, Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. What? He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not pure flesh of Adam, the, the pre-Adam, sinful Adam. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Sinful. Okay? God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin, a condemned sin in the flesh. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are, in, of the, are after the flesh do the things, do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So if you're overly obsessed by the things of life, uh, you can't go here, you can't eat that, you can't go here, blah, 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 blah. All the rules and little tiny rules and regulations that, that were not written down by anybody, but because you can't wear earrings, you can't wear white, you can't wear black, you can't, 
you know, can't tear your, wear your hair up. You have to wear it down. You can't cut it, blah, blah, blah. All the rules that man will try to put on you, that's fleshly thinking. I'm just saying, it's fleshly thinking. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. What? They can't please God? But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. What? If you are not, you don't have the spirit of Christ. If you are not in Christ, you're none of his. What? And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is, is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead be dwell in you, then how he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies, bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are we are debtors not to the flesh, but uh, to live after the flesh. For you live, uh, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, but if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many that are led by the Spirit, they are sons of God. For you are not, uh, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirits that we are children of God. We're no longer bonds people. We're no longer under the control and slavery of religion and men. We're, we're children of God. For if, and if children and heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, so if, if so that, we suffer with him that we might also be glorified together. Now, well, people might say, well, there's the mortifying the flesh, the mortifying the deeds of the body. Well, there are some things you have to do to mortify. <laughs> Abstain from uh, things sacrificed to idol. Don't eat blood. And uh, uh, remain unstained by the world by not participating in fornications. I mean, including pornography. It's all there. Okay? But... <laughs> There are some things that are just fleshly. For instance, um, don't drink wine. You can't go to the bar. You can't enjoy. You can't go to this club or you can't go to that dinner. Blah, 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 blah. All these things. Oh, you can't. You have to get out of bed on this side of the bed. And you have to. You can't watch the television show. You can't go to the movies. You, you know, like I said, I grew up in the church where it was so religious. You couldn't. Anybody you had, you brought an instrument into the church. You were a heretic. You were, you were blasphemous. <laughs> you were, you were a heathen. If you brought a musical instrument into the church. What? Do I think that now? No. But that's letting go of the flesh. Letting go of those religious rules that says you have to do this. You have to go here. Blah, 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 blah. And there was, of course, Peter, who, when Jesus lowered that, that sheet full of, of animals and said, go kill and eat. And he said, I'm not, I'm not, I've never done that. I can't do that. I've never eaten an unclean thing in my life. And Jesus has said, let go of it, Peter. You're no longer under those rules. You're no longer under that religious spirit. Let it go. And Peter had to let it go. And it must have been really, really hard. And it was hard for those Jews that went with him to witness what was happening. And in fact, it even said that they were, they were astounded when the Holy Spirit fell on the, on the Gentiles. And then to Peter commanded that they be baptized. And here it is in Rev, uh, Romans 6. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. forbid. How should we that are dead to sin li live any longer therein? Know you not that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? So how do you get into Christ? Through baptism. That's what Peter said. That's what Jesus said. That's what they all said. Getting into, setting you free from that religious spirit and the bondage of religion is to get into Christ and his freedom. Now, because Christ is free and when you're born again, you are a child. You are a child of God. You're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You're in the kingdom and you are child of the free woman. Okay. It's, this woman is setting you free. Okay. Her name is Jerusalem. That's Galatians 4.25. Now I want to go down here further. Um. Talking about wine, like I said, this guy all of a sudden he said, uh, "Don't drink." All in the middle of a sermon, <laughs> a really good talk, and all of a sudden we don't drink wine. I went, "Oh, oh wait, wait, you did it! What did he say?" Okay, <laughs> so let's just go to Luke seven. So here we are in Luke seven, and um, so he's telling he's telling the, <laughs> the disciples of John because John's freaking out. He's hearing all the tales. He drinks wine. <laughs> He's freaking out. And so he tells him to go and says, tell him what you see. How can someone who's in bondage do these things? If I'm under the religious rules and, and, and regulations of man, how could I be able to do these things? 
I mean, the religious people said you can't heal on the Sabbath and Jesus did it anyway. If he was listening to these people who who were trying to bind him and control him and tell him what to do and how to do it and when to do it, where to do it. It's like, you know, no, he's not under their control. So he tells them, I'm, I'm healing the sick. I'm setting the captive free. I'm, I'm the blind are seeing the deaf, deaf are hearing the, the dead are rising up from the dead. And that can only be done through the power of God. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so he's talking about these raiments and he, he brings up John's clothing and he's talking about those people who are in the kingdom and how beautifully they will be clothed. There's going to be a difference there. But, uh, um, but when you went out to see a prophet, yeah, I say into, and much more than a prophet. So John was much more than a prophet that he, who it is written, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. I, I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he is the least in the kingdom of God. But he that, uh, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And I was thinking again, like I said, when we when we clothe ourselves in Christ Jesus, we are putting on Him, and He is the kingdom. When you get into the waters of baptism, you are letting go of your old identity, and you are putting on Jesus, and He is God. Okay. And he is making you God-like. And therefore, this perfect, this perfect sacrifice of Godness. Okay? We had Adams before that did not sacrifice and only kept us in the level, level of being beasts. It never got never allowed us to rise above that level of beasthood. So therefore, we had to keep killing the beast in order to remain somewhat normal and human. To maintain our humanity, we had to keep killing beasts. You had to kill the beast. And here comes the perfect sacrifice of Godness. Jesus Christ, the perfect Godness. And he became our sacrifice in order for us to make, to find our Godness. And when we're in him, we put on Godness. We put on Jesus Christ's Godness when you're baptized into Jesus Christ. Don't let anybody lie to you, people. Don't let anybody lie to you. It's more than a ritual. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against them, not being not baptized of him. So the Pharisees wouldn't get into the waters of, of repentance. They wouldn't get into John's baptism, even though he was the greatest prophet. The Pharisees, who were way ultra-religious, wouldn't even get into the baptism of, of John. They wouldn't even take that, that, that step that would prepare their minds for Jesus Christ. Oh, all of a sudden I'm getting an inspiration. G John the Baptist baptized thousands and thousands of people. It was reported that everyone, all of Cana, came to him. And what it was doing, or Cana, was it Cana? I can't remember, Galilee. Anyway, wherever it was he was, when they heard about John, people went in droves by the thousands to be baptized in the baptism of John. And if he hadn't done that, the people wouldn't have been prepared to receive Jesus Christ. Because that beast had to be tamed enough. That reptile brain had to be tamed enough and, and, and cleansed enough for them to be able to perceive and hear the next step. To hear the next and greatest move of God. Because their eyes and ears would have been blind and deafened. They couldn't have been able to perceive it. And so therefore the baptism of John was actually extremely important. It was extremely important to prepare them to hear the next message and move of God. That is huge. I just realized that. Okay, so. So, but the the. the the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees wouldn't even do that. They wouldn't get in. That's why when Jesus came, they were extremely blind and extremely deaf. They were so unprepared and completely rejecting the truth and the gospel. They couldn't receive it or prepare. Even They couldn't. They couldn't receive it. Their minds were that controlled. And the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the, the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. 
And the Lord said, Wheresoever then shall I liken the men of this generation, and to what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace, and calling one to another, and saying, We have piped you unto you, and you have not danced. We have mourned to you, and you have not wept. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking. Well, what is he drinking? Wine. <laughs> I'm drinking wine, people. He's drinking wine. And you say, Behold, a glutton, a gluttonous man, and a wine bibber, <laughs> and a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. Her children. There you go. Jesus even says her children of wisdom. And you'll find that in the book of Proverbs where wis wisdom is described as a she. And the wis but wisdom is justified of all her children. Wisdom is, is bring, calling in her, her children, which is, of course, we're the children of the, of the, of Jerusalem. Galatians 4.25, we are children of Jerusalem, who is the mother of us all. She's the spirit of wisdom. And she's calling to her children. And this is what they do to us people. This is what these scribes and Pharisees do. They say one thing, oh, this person, he's a, he's a, well, they say he's, he's, he's neither drinking bread nor drinking wine and he's a devil. This is what they said about John the Baptist. The, the Pharisees who wouldn't get into the waters of repentance of John's baptism. Oh, he's a devil. This is what they're doing today. You can, there's nothing you can do. Please, if you do one thing, they'll call you something. If you do the do the exact opposite, they'll call you something else. They have some every way of making sure that they are always making you feel condemned for everything you do. There's nothing you can do right in their eyes. You can't do anything right in their eyes. You have a glass of wine, you're a wine bibber. You abstain, you're a devil. <laughs> you're uh, you're a prude. You're this. You're that. They have all kinds of ways of making sure you're controlled. These religious people. And making sure that you're always feeling condemned and judged by what they say. They're a bunch of hypocrites is what they are. And they will always find a way to condemn you. Don't listen to them. Because as children of the free woman, you don't have to listen to that nonsense. Just saying. When you're, when you're free in Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Just saying. Believe it. Don't let these religious people control you. Because they will. So here is Jesus saying that they're calling him a drunkard. <laughs> they call John the Baptist the devil. So anyway, just saying that because <laughs> it was coming to my mind this morning as I was thinking on it, thinking how when you are putting on, when you put on Christ Jesus, when you get into the waters of baptism and you are putting him on, God is setting you free from that religious spirit that's controlling us and uh, and that's one reason why men will forbid baptism they don't want you to be baptized because they don't want you to be out of from under their control and their power they want to be able to maintain that control on you so they will say oh you don't need to be baptized oh it's just a ritual it's not that important you've got the holy spirit just stay with that and be a sinner saved with saved by grace and that's all right but you know what happens and i've said it so many times now my mantra <laughs> how in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, we see these churches, seven of them, and only one, only one church isn't judged for their works. Only one. All the other churches are religious. On some level or the other, they're religious. They're controlled by man. Six churches out of seven, number six, the number of men, Six churches out of seven are controlled by man. And if there is, you do not repent, you're going to be judged. And only one church, only one, is not judged for their works. And in fact, are promised to be removed from the hour of tribulation, which shall come upon all the world to try them. Revelation 3.7, that's the church of Philadelphia, which by the main way means brotherly love. It is also the sixth church, interestingly enough, but this church defeats that spirit of man. Okay, why? Because they are in Christ and there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8. How do you get into to Christ? When get free from condemnation? Well, that would be a Romans 6. 
you're free from sin and condemnation when you get into Jesus Christ through water baptism. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the what? Remission of your sins, so that, that you will be received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, if you have your sins are remished or rem removed, then how can man condemn you? There is no separating you from the love of God. There's no separation. I think that's in Romans, actually. Let me just go back and find it. Romans, there's now therefore no condemnation. I know it's Romans 8. Let me see if I can find it. There is now therefore no con no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And then you go all the way to the bottom of the chapter, and I believe that it says that there is nothing that can separate us. Let me just see if it's here. Because we're now a spirit of adoption. Mm, uh, is this the chapter? Oh, yep, 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 it is. Uh, Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress uh, or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep to the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. More. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come. I think that would be just about everything. Nor heights nor depths nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you nothing and that is for baptized believers because two chapters before in the same book what shall we say shall we continue in sin that grace may abound god forbid how shall we that are dead to sin living any longer therein know you not that as many of us were baptized into jesus christ were baptized into his death i think it's quite clear there and it's a lie when they say oh this is the baptism of the holy spirit it's not talking about that and we all know it so don't listen to those people, those liars who have said that to you all these years. They're liars. They're snakes. They're snakes in the grass trying to steal your salvation. They're trying to steal your salvation and control you with religious spirit and keep you um, uh, under their condemnation and control and religion. Re Revelations 3, 7, the only church that is not judged for their works. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth no, and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. No man can separate you from the love of God. Nothing can separate you. Why? Because you are now without condemnation. Because you are in Christ Jesus. The other churches, it's conditional salvation. Read it for yourself. I'm not going to do it again. I've done it a hundred times now. At least... There is a possibility, and a probably a probability for a lot of these people in those those different churches, seven, six of them, a lot of them lose their salvation. It's a conditional situation for them. This is the only one where it is not conditional, that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing. Why? Because you are in Christ. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The door is open. When did the doors open? At Jesus' baptism, his water baptism. I know thy works. Behold, I've set before thee an open door. What? Where's the, where's the, if you don't do this and if you don't do that? If you don't do this, you don't drink wine. Don't go to the bar. <laughs> you know, don't go, don't, don't go to the beach on Saturday. Don't do all these other things. Where is that? There's got to be something in there. And no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue the same which say they are Jews and are not. But do lie, behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And to know that I have loved thee. Also, something just came to my mind today. I was thinking about all these people who are who are kneeling, and I think this came this first came to my mind. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet. They're kneeling, people. These people, these proud people, are kneeling. 
whether they know it or not, they're kneeling to the church. They're kneeling to the church of Philadelphia. They're coming and they don't even realize it. Remember that dream? I, I had to go back this morning. I had to go back and look at one of my dreams. I had complete, I forgot where it was, that it was in Royal Pains, my video called Royal Pains. And how, uh, uh, um, how God was removing the crown from the royal family in Britain. And, um, uh, I can't remember her name, the, the woman who's married to, uh, William and how in this dream she was holding this crown and she couldn't put it on her head. And <laughs> this, the servant tried to, he was trying to, uh, kick me out or do something. I don't know what it was, the security guard. And I got him on his knees. I said, you get on your knees. And he took a knee. He took a knee. And I know it's been going on for some time. Ka Kaepernick or whatever his name is, has been taking a knee. But people, just think about this. We think that they're trying to, they try to force us to take a knee. It's not happening. It's not going to happen. But they're being forced to take a knee. They're coming to their knees. Behold, I will make them come, come and worship before thy feet unto know that I have loved thee. They are surrendering and they don't even realize it. They think that they're surrendering to their God Satan, they've already did that. That's not, that's a given. They already did that. When they gave over their power to Satan years ago, for some of them years and years ago, decades ago, they already took a knee. What they're doing now is they're surrendering and whether they know it or not, they're surrendering to the brotherhood, to the brotherhood of Christ, this, this church of Philadelphia, they are surrendering it and they don't even realize what they're doing. They're taking a knee because they are losing and they know it. And they think this is the only way that they're going to keep surviving is to take a knee. Let them do it. They're, they're only showing who they are. They're only exposing who's, who's of the synagogue of Satan. Think about that for a second. They are exposing that they are the synagogue of Satan. The ones who are not taking the knees, that would be Jesus Christ, his people, his, his church, his bride. We're not taking a knee. We don't need to. We've already surrendered ourselves to Jesus Christ. He's the one we, we surrendered two years ago when, or whenever it was that we gave our life to him. He's the one who we surrendered to. And if you, you're seeing people taking a knee, it's because they're surrendering and they don't even realize it. They don't even realize it. This is the year, people, when the synagogue of Satan is going to be going to their knees. Because I was kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them to dwell upon the earth. Behold, I will come quickly, hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. What? No man take thy crown? This is the year of the crown. I told you that's the beginning of the year when this coronavirus, which they decided to change to COVID. <laughs> you can't fool us. I mean, sorry, you put it out there. Now you're, you're changing the name, trying to think that we don't know. We know what you're up to. You're trying to steal our crown. That you're not going to be able to let no man steal your crown. This is the year of the crown. Dream of the, about the crown. <laughs> They're taking a knee, people. No man's going to steal our crown. No man's going to put us into that religious box again. We're going to be set free from that religious, religious minded, reptilian thinking. We're going to have the mind of Christ where we know our freedom, where we know what Christ Jesus, he's the Lord of the Sabbath, and so are we. Because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. There's no condemnation if we happen to take an extra long walk on the beach on a Saturday. What? You took a walk on the beach? Oh. <laughs> You're breaking my mind. Come on, people. You're being set free. We're putting on our God image. We're putting on Jesus Christ and his freedom. That's what we're getting. We're no longer under that religious system. We're being set free from their condemnation. Okay, just saying. Isn't that exciting? That should be exciting. Woohoo! And him that overcometh will make a pillar in the temple of my God, he, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him in my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear the Spirit say unto the churches. Where does it say repent in this book? It doesn't! What? There's Repent is not in this, in this uh, letter at all. There's no repent in there. Why? Because you already did it. <laughs> Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What? Yes, we've already repented when you changed your mind about Jesus, and you did what he told you to do. You've already surrendered to Christ. And then the Holy Spirit does the rest. The Holy Spirit comes into you and begins the process of sanctification. 
and removing that religious spirit because you're now children of the free woman. Okay? So, anyway, I know I've gotten really passionate, passionate because I'm passionate about Christ. I'm passionate. We are living in exciting times. We're living in the time when we're being set free. We're seeing the synagogue of Satan coming to their knees. This is exciting stuff. We should be excited. Now, I there I know there's there's a thing going around right now saying that there's no rapture. I, I don't again there is a rapture and there are so many proofs that there is a rapture. I know that the, we're all excited because we're seeing the surrender of the synagogue of Satan. But according to the scriptures, there is a rapture. Don't let anybody fool you with, with their hopes and dreams and ideologies, which are not true. There, the thousand year reign does not begin, does not begin until after the tribulation and the mark of the beast. It does not begin until that is finished and Jesus Christ himself personally, not Donald Trump or the 144,000 or some other man comes along, the thousand year reign does not begin until Christ himself comes to the earth. And between the time of the rapture and the time of that, the Jesus Christ appearing on earth, there is a tribulation period, which the bride of Christ will be removed from. And if you want to be part of that bride and you be not be one of the five foolish virgins that got left behind because you didn't have oil in your lamp and you weren't fully prepared, you can take those steps right now while there is still time because I don't know how much time there is. I don't know how much time there is. You don't either. And there was this, you know, this uh, preacher guy or, or pastor who just had this vision. I don't know whether his vision's right or wrong. I don't know. Lord hasn't spoken to me on it. But I do know that we are in some amazing times. If we're seeing the synagogue of Satan coming to their knees, they're, they're, they're surrendering because they're starting to see that they're they're doomed. They truly are doomed and they're, they're taking a knee. Okay? And if we're seeing that, then we must be really, really close. Just saying. We must be really, really close. And don't let anybody say that they're, you know, here's Jesus Christ. The marriage supper of the Lamb has finally come. He comes on a rider on the white horse. And he has his 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 vestures dipped in blood, and the name of his is uh is called and his name is called the Word of God, and then he comes following the wine press uh, tribulation period when the wine the wine press the the grapes of wrath for those people who are disobedient uh the wine harvest is actually the people who will be saved during the tribulation and they will have their heads cut off. That's that's the wine press wine press uh, judgment for those people who were lukewarm and left behind and have were not protected through the tribulation period there will be there will be saints who will be protected if you're left behind don't be hopeless don't be don't be hopeless but if you're left behind you are going to be either two two groups you'll be of the group that, of people of the saints who will be protected and uh, saved from the uh, wine press because of your faith, what you will find in Revelation chapter 12, before the mark of the beast uh, shows up, before, before, after the dragon is uh, thrown down, after the woman gives birth, there is a group of people, and here it is in Revelation chapter 12. Um, who will be saved from the wine press? Um, yeah, let me see if I can find it. Uh -huh. so, and the woman were to give uh, uh so I know there's something here hold on just let me just find it quickly before I run out of time hold a second okay so in Revelation chapter 12 the woman gives birth in heaven okay so there's two different places what's it, what's what occurring in the spiritual must manifest in the physical Okay, so there's a woman in heaven. It's a spiritual thing. A woman in heaven gives birth to a baby. She gives birth. She's she once she's delivered. Satan's trying to destroy her and the baby can't do it. Michael stands up. Michael finally stands up when he finally sees his baby, who's without spot or wrinkle and has got this strength in it. And this baby represents a new spirit that's being born in the spirit. Now remember, the bride's in heaven right now. The bride has been removed through the rapture in Revelation chapter 6, the sixth seal. 
Okay, we see the rapture church in Revelation chapter 7 after this 144,000 are marked to keep them from the hour of tribulation that's coming upon the whole world, they will be saved and kept safe. Okay, and everyone get, everyone starts to hide in dens and caves. Everybody starts to they, they go underground because there's a great disaster coming. And uh, nobody can say to me that that's happened yet because it hasn't. Okay. Uh, so there is this wonder in heaven, Revelation chapter 12. This is after the rapture of the church, the bride's in heaven. She's been removed before all that goes down. And she, there's a war in heaven after she has this baby. Michael finally stands up. Michael, the angel, finally takes a stand. Okay? He hasn't done that yet. He takes a stand, throws down Satan. Now Satan's really mad. I mean, he was mad before. Now he's really mad. So the woman in heaven goes into the wilderness in the spiritual sense, in the spirit realm, for three and a half years. Well, whatever happens in the spirit realm must manifest in the physical. So what happens? Satan is thrown down. Revelation chapter 12, 7. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought the angels, and prevailed not. Neither was the place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil. There's that reptile. And, and which deceives the whole world. He was cast out unto the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So he's been cast to the earth. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of our Christ. So now we come into full strength. We were, Christ was strong. There's no doubt he was strong on his own. But he didn't want to be strong on his own. He wanted his people to be equally strong with him, to be equally yoked with him. So he left and left, gave us the Holy Spirit in order to what? To sanctify us, to strengthen us, to remove the lies and the deceptions that have been controlling our minds for centuries, thousands of years. And the Holy Spirit is in the process of removing all of this dross, all this crap from our systems. And now we are strong with Christ. Okay, and now after this child is born, and now the angels are now standing up on our behalf. Now, now we there's a voice in heaven that says, "Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God." This Christ is coming into His full power to be like His Father. To be like His Father, He has to do what His Father does. Okay, He has to have a son. I know it's going to freak you all out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry it's freaking you out, but I'm going to go there. He has to have a son. He does what the father does. The father is in his full strength. He has a son. And Jesus must have a son. One of these days, I'm going to tell you what it was I said to the Lord, and I haven't told you yet. But when I tell you, when I tell you what it was I said, I'm almost there. I'm close to telling you what it was I said to the Lord. But this is what it is. And the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of the brethren is cast down. What does he do? Was he, he's the accuser. He is a condemner. He's the judger. He judged, he's been judging humanity and he's thrown down. Now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is now therefore no condemnation. And he's the accuser of the brethren is thrown down because now there is no accusation against us. None. We are like God. We become equally yoked. Through our, the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, which accused them before our God day and night. And that's the religious spirit, people. He's always judging. Doesn't matter what you do, one this way or you do that. It doesn't matter. He's going to judge you either way. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of the testimony, and they loved not their life to death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the world, of the earth, and to the sea. And for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knoweth his time is but short. Now, so he was in heaven, making war with the saints in the spirit realm, and now he's on earth in the physical. So what happens? Well, whatever happened in the physical, in the, in the, whatever happened in the uh, uh, spiritual has got to manifest in the physical. So what do we see here? The physical manifesting what just occurred in the spiritual. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. What is he talking about? He's talking about the saints left on earth. And the woman which gave were given two wings of a great eagle, and she might fly into the wilderness in her place where she was nourished for a time, times half and time, the same amount of time as the woman in heaven. The woman in heaven, this is not Mary, people. This is not Mary. 
because if Mary, Mary had or was a woman on earth and she gave birth. And so we see what had happened in the spiritual. It already happened once. An earth woman fled into the wilderness. Okay, that's it's already occurred. This is this is something that's already occurred. And it occurred first in the first in the spirit realm. When did it occur the first time in the spirit realm? When the Holy Spirit gave birth. When the Holy Spirit gave birth to the man child or to the, the spirit Jesus Christ, which is God, and he was there in the beginning because just like the Holy Spirit was always in the man, or it, like for instance, the woman was always part of the man. Okay. You take the man out, you take the woman out of the man, she was always in the man. Therefore, she is part of man. She, and the same thing with God. God removed his spirit, separated the two. He became a two, but he's also one because he's married. The woman was always, the, the, the spirit of God was always God because she was always a part of him. And the two, when they came together, just like when you have a child, the child was always a part of you and therefore always create was always part of the creation of everything that was created when you when you are planning making plans for your life you're planning for children your children are part of your plans they're in your thoughts they're in your mind they're in part of your 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 kingdom if you will your little household is your kingdom i'm gonna have children we have dogs i'm gonna have we're gonna have we're gonna, have, da, 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 da. We're gonna do this and we're gonna do these things this is gonna be part of our little kingdom and children are there they're in your minds. You're already planning for them because they're part of you. Okay? And God, it's a greater sense, of course. It's greater. And God, I'm sure, has a greater awareness of his His, his own kingdom and what was going to come when he separated himself from... So it already happened in the spirit realm. Then it manifests in the physical. Okay? Mary gives, a, gives birth. But we're talking about the future here. This is a future event. Don't let anybody fool you and say, none of this stuff has happened yet. The third temple has not been built. The third temple has not been built. Okay? And don't let anybody fool you because this has not happened yet. They will try to tell you it's just an allegory. It is not just an allegory. This is more than that. <clears throat> so, I know I'm going on here. I actually didn't want to go into all this, but I'm going to bring it up anyway. Since I've already gone here, let's go there. <laughs> so here we have this woman in, in heaven. A woman in heaven gives birth. Okay, not the Holy Spirit. It's not Mary because Mary's a woman and she's down here on earth and she already did, did this. But this is a woman in heaven. Now we have to manifest in the physical. So we're talking about here the, this is, this is when the world, um, I believe this is when the world actually gets, free from the abortion and the uh, the sacrifice of children it doesn't occur until after this we, we want it to be done now i know you do we all do we all want it to be finished all this child sacrifice stuff and and killing our throwing our kids to moloch and the bales and all that kind of stuff well disgusting to think about but i don't think that we actually conquer it, it that doesn't get conquered that spirit doesn't get conquered until the woman in heaven gives birth and when it happens, um, that's when Satan is really wrathful. He's thrown down to the earth. And that's when he goes after the woman, the remnant of the church. He goes after the remnant of the church that are left behind believers. And it says that she is protected for time, times, and half time. The same amount of time that the, the Antichrist spirit has to rule and reign, that three and a half year period, He's given, um, that's how long she will be protected from the mark of the beast. So there will be a group of people, if you're left behind, there will be a group of people who Satan will go after you, but God will protect you. There will be, there will be divine protection. However it comes, I don't know, but you will be protected from the mark of the beast. Now, not everyone will be, not everyone will be, because as you read in Revelation chapter 12, that there's a three and a half year period where the woman believers in Christ who are the physical manifestation of the woman in heaven, she will be, uh, because remember the church is spiritual. I read that for you. We are spiritual. The bride is spiritual. We are no longer carnal. Romans, Romans six, Romans eight, read it. 
We are who are born again, who are in Christ, are now spiritual beings. And we, this child in the spirit, which we are, because we've been covered in this man, the God man's blood, we are now putting on his identity. We are his bride and we are equally yoked with him. And here comes, uh, so those people who are still carnal, believers in Christ, who are left behind because they're carnal and not spiritual because they had not taken the steps to get into the waters of baptism. Read it for yourself. Uh, I know this is hard for your minds to get around. It was hard for my mind to get around. But if you are carnal, you will be left behind. You can't be removed as a spotless bride of Christ, if you are carnally minded, and that means you're not fully surrendered to Christ Jesus. It's not possible. But there is still opportunity, even when the tribulation occurs and Satan is cast down, you will be protected. And this is what it says here in Revelation chapter 12. Now, to go on further, the mark of the beast does occur. Okay. Um, the 144,000 are removed. I think the 144,000 are the world's protection up to this point. The 144,000 are incredibly important to this whole revelation thing. They are the guardians to actually hold back the Antichrist. The Antichrist does not re truly reveal himself until after three and a half years and the, and the, the temple's been built. And the two witnesses show up outside the temple and they're proclaiming their what God tells them to say and so the Antichrist can't he's actually being restrained he's being restrained up to that point okay he's being restrained the Antichrist cannot come into his power until the 144,000 are removed because they are the restrainer okay when they are removed then the Antichrist rises to his full power and that's when he demands people take the mark of the beast. So, uh, yeah, that's the scenario. Read it for yourself. It's very, very plain. I've gone over it before. So if you're hearing people tell you there, there's no rapture, they're wrong. They're, they are reading the scriptures wrong. <laughs> they're very hopeful for the world. And God bless them. I, I, I can understand their hope for the world. And there is hope for the world. There will be a thousand year reign, but not yet. Not till Christ Jesus himself comes back. But there will be a wine-pressed harvest. Isn't that interesting that Jesus said he will not drink the wine until a certain period of time. Now, let me see if I can find that verse. I know I'm going on. Just hold on. Uh, Luke 22, 17. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. So he is um, giving up wine at the moment. <laughs> Jesus is giving up wine until after the wine press uh, harvest, which is in Revelation. Uh, Revelation chapter... You see the beast rise, the great prostitute, the seven bowls of wrath, which are really horrible and I don't recommend anybody wanting to be there for it um, but first before there is the mark of the beast occurs in Revelation chapter 13 not a coincidence that it's a 13 not a coincidence and then you see the hundred the 144,000 they are removed and then you see the harvest of the earth and it is the wine press harvest and I, and lo, uh, I looked and lo, uh, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud, one sat like unto the Son of Man, that being Jesus, having on his head a gold crown, and on his, in his hand a sharp sickle. What do you use a sickle for? When you're harvesting grapes. You use sickles for um, wheat harvests too. But the wheat, we are the wheat harvest. Those who are baptized into Jesus Christ are the wheat harvest, which is what John said, John the Baptist, was saying that Jesus will come, come and gather his wheat. We are the wheat. And we're not the wine harvest, those people who are left behind and have to face the mark, the mark of the bees, the, the image of the bees and all that rest of the stuff during the tribulation. They are the wine harvest. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are wheat. Okay. So, so John says he's coming to gather his wheat. 
there are different harvests. This this is the, the, the grape harvest. And another angel came in out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat in the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap. For the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And as he sat in the cloud, thrust in the circle of the earth, the earth was reaped. And another uh, angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which um, which have the power of the fire, and cried out with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vines of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle in the earth, and gathered the vines of the earth, and to cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and the blood of, came out of the winepress, even unto the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. So here is called the winepress of God's wrath. Now, what's going on here? And is we find out in the next chapter, is that this is the saints of God being having their heads cut off. Okay? Because the mark of the beast says that they, if they do not receive the mark of the beast, 666, in their hand or their forehead, which hasn't happened yet, people. So none of this has happened yet because there's nowhere in history has has the, the, the beast risen to the point where he's been forcing people to put a mark of 666 on their forehead or on their hands. It hasn't happened yet. So don't let anybody fool you. This has not happened yet. This is a future event. What happens in the next chapter? You see the souls of them standing on the sea of glass. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So these saints who come to Christ, who are not the woman who's been fled, who's fled into the wilderness, who will be protected during the time of the tribulation, like I said, there will be people who will be protected, who are saints of God, who are Christians at this time, who will be protected for three and a half years during this period. Okay, pray you're one of them if you're left behind. But the rest, we're going to have to make a very, very hard decision. The rest of mankind are going to have to make a real hard decision. They're going to have to decide to receive the mark or have their heads cut off. Okay? For I saw it, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. Now, what did you see the fire before? You saw it in the church of Laodicea. He says, I chastise those. I'm going to, first of all, he tells them in the, the book of Laodicea, the, the letter to the, the church of Laodicea, he tells them he's, they're going to be left behind. He's spitting them out because they're lukewarm. And he tells them he chastised them. And he says to buy gold refined in the fire. It's not a coincidence. When you look at what the glass making, you put glass, which is sand, and you burn it till it melts and becomes like glass in the fire. And here these people are standing on the seat of glass, mingled with fire. It's not a coincidence. And them that gotten the victory over what? Over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name standing on the sea of glass having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are the works, the Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints, who shall not who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name. And it goes on, it talks about how they are clothed in white raiment before the seven last plagues um, that are for all those who have been left behind and took the mark. All those people who did not allow God to harvest them by having their heads cut off. This is God doing, people. Jesus told them to harvest with a sickle. And he's putting, giving these people one last, it's a very merciful thing. He's giving them one last chance. He's giving the world one last chance to change their minds and repent. He's giving them one last opportunity to come to salvation and millions and millions of people who are not the woman uh, chased into the wilderness. These people will, who have still not made a choice for God, are going to give them one last chance. And millions and millions of people will 
have their heads be, uh, cut off because this is what it says here. Millions of people would rather die than take that mark. <clears throat> and then once they're harvest and it's, the blood is filled up to maximum, the wrath of God, that's why it's called the wrath, the harvest of the God's wrath, because this is God's, he's filling up his cup of wrath with the, every, every saint that's blood is spilt, is being filled up in this cup. <clears throat> and once that cup is full, that's when that cup of the seven, the seven last plagues is poured out. And those who took the mark are going to be plagued to death plagued to death until the very last thing which happens which those are still alive Jesus Christ comes as the rider on the white horse with his garment dipped in blood stained with the blood of the saints and his enemies he's he's covered in blood from all the bloodiness that's been it just occurred that's occurred on the earth he's covered in bloodiness people and that's when <laughs> He establishes the thousand year reign. So don't let anybody fool you. I know it's so it's so enticing to think, well, we are going to have victory. I'm already told you that the Church of Philadelphia, I've been telling you this for years now, almost since I came on YouTube 10 years ago, it was 11, nine years ago, that we have the victory over the synagogue of Satan and we're seeing it happen. That's amazing. That's wonderful. It's happening right now and before our very eyes. But the thousand year reign does not begin until Christ himself comes on the white horse. Don't be fooled because in Revelation chapter 19, the thousand year reign does not begin until Christ himself, nobody else, no substitute, nobody from the tribe of Judah except for himself, Jesus Christ, comes himself in person on a white horse. And when he comes, it's then that he establishes his kingdom on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. He's already established his earth in uh, his kingdom in heaven, because like I said, whatever happens in the spiritual must manifest in the physical. So now he's manifesting what he's just established in heaven on earth. And the dead in Christ, uh, the, the first resurrection occurs on earth, not the bride. Because that would not be in the likeness of his death, res burial, resurrection. He was, you know, when it's what Bi what the Bible says in Romans 6. When you're baptized into Christ Jesus, you will be raised in likeness and ascended in likeness of Jesus Christ. Okay? But if you are not, then, you, then everything has to occur here on earth. It has to occur because you're earthbound. You're carnal. You're not spiritual. You haven't yet taken off that spirit, that carnal mind. You haven't let go of your old self. You're still connected to the earth. So therefore, that has to, all, the first resurrection occurs on earth. It's not talking about the rapture. The rapture has already occurred for the spiritual. I know I've gone off on a totally different tangent here, but that's okay. I hope you, I hope you don't mind because actually it goes together. I'm talking about wine here. I'm talking about the religious, letting go of the carnal minded. And the only way to do that is to get into Jesus Christ. And that's not my words, not my theology, it's not my religion. It is what Christ himself said. Peter said, Paul said, they all said, John said, they all knew it. I'm not telling you anything different. I'm telling you what it says in the scripture. Don't let any man take your crown. Don't let any steal your crown. Don't let any man or person steal the truth from you. With their religious ideas and their religious philosophies oh you don't have to be baptized it's just a ritual don't believe it it's a lie from satan it's reptilian it's reptilian people so anyway all that to say you don't want to be left behind you know nobody wants to be left behind and yes there is a rapture don't let anybody steal that from you either because it's true the church of philadelphia has promised that there's an hour of tribulation that's coming upon the whole world, not just one place at a time. The whole world is going through an hour of tribulation. And the only church that is told not to repent is because they've already done it. <laughs> the only church that has not, uh, is not told to repent is the Church of Philadelphia. The only church that has the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit written on them as their seal, 
You can't be sealed with the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit unless you've been baptized into Jesus Christ. It's what Jesus said. Jesus said it himself. I'll read it for you in a moment. You're not sealed with the Holy Spirit and the Father and Jesus Christ. Then how in the world are you going to be recognized as being part of Christ? I mean, his kingdom. That's how you become part of his kingdom. Think about it, people. It's not that hard. It's easy. I, I, I guess the reason why I'm so passionate is because time is short. And this is my calling. <laughs> he called me. He gave me this calling and this understanding and it's opening my eyes in ways that I didn't know. I didn't know all these hundreds and hundreds of different reasons why to be baptized. I, you think this is just me? <laughs> I mean, it's partly me, but that's because God opened my mind to it. And I'm trying to help you to see so that you can let other people see. You don't want anybody left behind. It's going to be pretty awful. And yes, there is a tribulation. Don't let it be fool you. Yes, it's exciting what we're going through now. We're seeing the downfall of the synagogue of Satan. We're seeing them come crumbling. We're seeing them crumble. But that does not change the scriptures. We will be removed from the hour of tribulation, which is what it says here in Revelation chapter 3. Because thou hast kept my word of patience, I will keep you from the hour of tribu tribulation or temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. There's a, going to be a period of time and this church will be removed from it. Revelation chapter 6, the sixth seal, it matches Matthew 24. I've, I've done videos on that. Matthew 6, the sixth seal matches Matthew 24. Um, then you have Revelation chapter 7 and the 144,000 are sealed with the name of the Father. Not the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but the name of the Father. And this is before a worldwide wide catastrophe hits the earth and they're protected from it. Read it yourself. Revelation chapter 7, it's there. And then after you see these 144,000 sealed for this world catastrophe that's getting ready to occur, you see the bride in heaven in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. These people who are clothed in kingdom clothing, they're clothed in white. They made themselves without spot or wrinkle. And the only way to do that is to put on Christ Jesus. Revelation chapter 8, we see the seventh seal opening. And guess what happens, people? World disaster. World disaster of biblical proportions occur on the earth. This hasn't happened yet. We've had wars. We've had rumors of wars, but we haven't had this. Okay? Don't let anybody fool you. Just saying. Not to mention First uh, Thessalonians. Let me just see if I can find it. Hold on. Just a second. <clears throat> but I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep, that you saw or not, even as others which have no hope. For we believe that Jesus Christ, Jesus died and rose again, even so, them that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this day, for this we say unto you by the word, uh, word of the Lord, that we that which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them that sleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we shall ever be with the Lord. This is not talking about the earthly resurrection and the first resurrection in Revelation chapter 20. This is talking about the rapture of the church because we're meeting him in the air because we're spiritual. We will receive new bodies just like Christ ascended into heaven with his new body transformed. That's us who are dying, who've died in Christ, who are asleep in Christ, who have been put on a new identity. You will go up and meet him in the air. The first resurrection in Revelation chapter 20 doesn't occur, doesn't occur until Christ comes down on earth and puts his foot on the earth. Okay, think about that. There is a connection. The first resurrection in Revelation chapter 20 of those who did not take the mark of the beast occurs on earth after Christ has put his foot on the earth. But here in this chapter, Christ is in the air 
we rise from the dead. If you're dead in Christ, you rise from the dead. If you're already alive, you put on your new body and we all meet him in the air. And we will ever be with him in the spirit realm, in the kingdom of God, in the new Jerusalem. That's our home. He's taking us home, people. It's not the same thing. Okay. <clears throat> so, all that to say. <laughs> Sorry, I went on so long. I didn't expect to go this I actually probably made, should have made two videos, but uh, you know me, once I get on a topic, sometimes I jump, jump into something else because the Lord leads me different places and my mind goes all over the all over the place from here to there, da, 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 trying to help you to connect the dots. That's the way my mind thinks. My mind goes from one thing. I don't stay in one little place and say, well, that's it. <laughs> my mind jump, jumps over to something else and then jumps over here and then jumps over there and jumps over in order to see that there's, there's a huge picture going on here. And everything is connected. There's a code. Everything is connected. You just can't take one verse out of the Bible and say, that's it. You see, the Bible says, for God so loved the world, he, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What? That's it. That's the only verse you ever need to know. Don't learn anything else. Well, then if you read the whole entire chapter, you find out it's talking about baptism. What? Water baptism. That's what he's talking about. Read it for yourself. John 3. And the reason I'm urgent about it is because we've been lied to. We've been lied to, people. We've been lied to and lied to and lied to and lied to. Sometimes intentionally so and sometimes not. But nonetheless, that religious spirit does not want you to be free. The religious spirit and the religious mind do not want you to be free. They do not want you to be children of the free woman. They want you, they want you controlled. They want to control you. Depending on how controlled they are and religious they are themselves, they can make your life utterly miserable. Look at the Pharisees, what they did to people. Oh my gosh, the woes that Jesus, and you can read it for yourself, all the woes. My goodness, Jesus wasn't playing with them. These religious minded people. He was not playing. Woe, woe to you scribes and Pharisees. Your whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but you're full of dead men's bones. You ain't fooling here, people. And guess what? You don't have to be afraid of them. You don't have to be under their condemnation because the accuser of the brethren is being thrown down and is going to his knees, people. He's taking a knee. He's taking a knee. Exciting stuff. So, if you have not yet given your life to Jesus Christ, I'm going to read the, verse, the words of Jesus himself, who wants to set us free from these religious spirits. Jesus himself, <clears throat> I've already um, read millions of times, or at least not millions, but hundreds. I'm exaggerating. If you didn't know, I'm exaggerating. Um, but the Great Commission, Jesus Christ, Matthew 28, 16, and then the 11 went away into Galilee, into, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, not just the Jewish people, and not just for a little 100-year period or 20-year period of time. Go and teach all the nations. That means the Gentiles too, not just the Jews. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. Matthew 3, verse 12. He that am overcome, overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I'll write upon him the name of my God, the Father, the name of the city of my God, the Holy Spirit, which is New Jerusalem which comes down out of the heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. That would be Jesus, the Son. Okay, Galatians 4.25. Galatians 4.24, 4, this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. That's the law, that's the religious, religious training in the covenant. And answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou that bearest not, break forth and cry thou which travailest not, for the desolate has more children than she that hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of the promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh is persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. 
So we are children of promise. Where did we see that? Oh, yeah, that would be Acts 2, 38. Or Acts 2, 38. Yeah, let's go there. <clears throat> for Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and your children, for all that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. What promise is that? Well, that would be the promise of Abraham to Isaac. About Isaac. Here it is, people. We are the children of promise. We are the children of promise. We are the children of the free woman. So, anyway, I think I've said enough. And I'm sure I'll have more to say later. <laughs> I always do. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> so, anyway, all that because I was, I was like I said, listening to this, this guy. <laughs> I was listening to this guy and all of a sudden he was you have going on. A, he was on a great roll. Oh my goodness. I was really enjoying his sermon. And all of a sudden, and because we're Christians, we don't drink wine. I'm like, what? Why did you say that? Oh my goodness. You just ruined it for me. <laughs> now I've got to say something. So anyway, that's all I got to say for now. And God bless and have a great day.